like it. Well, to tell you the truth, sir, it feels all swimming. Makes me wonder what Mrs. Columbo had in mind. Welcome to episode 47 of the Columbo Podcast, where we too wonder what Mrs. Columbo had in mind. Well, she knows he doesn't really have the best sea legs. In your opinion? Well, we've seen this in numerous episodes. Ah, right, you mean his ability to be at sea. To thrive in a watery environment. Yeah. More comfortable on the land, isn't he? Usually. How are we doing, Ian? Not too bad, not too bad. It feels like we've not done this for a while. It's been almost a month, but for listeners it's been just a few days. I watched this episode about two or three weeks ago now. Before you went away? Can't remember anything about it. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. It's one of my my favourites when I was a, a kid. I really enjoyed this. Really? Yep. Said before, I think it was last week's episode. I do love a, a TV show or a movie set on a movie set. Yeah, it was reminiscent of a few of the other ones we've seen with movie sets, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. So I detect by your surprise that you maybe don't think this is top notch? I found this episode a bit frustrating. Okay. Because there's parts of it that I think were really good, Mm -hmm. and then there's other parts that were just not good at all. That's fair enough. There were some weaknesses, but as you rightly said, I think there are elements which are are very strong. But that's what we can discuss, and we can get to that during the, the course of this episode. Yeah. So, without further ado, Ian, do you fancy giving us this week's summary? Sure. Crack on. Alex Brady is a young filmmaker with a bright future, until he receives a visit from childhood friend Lenny Fisher. Fisher's sister Jenny died in a motorcycle accident ten years earlier, and Lenny has learned that the story he'd been told of an accident on her way to film with Alex was a lie, and there is footage of her death on set with the cameras rolling. Faced with exposure and ruin, Brady opts to kill his former friend, luring him onto a film set and to his death by electrocution. His initial hope to avoid suspicion by preventing identification of the body goes immediately awry. But can Lieutenant Columbo separate fact from fiction in time to close the case before the credits roll? Thank you, Ian. An electric summary there, not a a shocker. (laughs) We start off in a... And Universal Studios. It's not named, but that's where it is. Yeah, we get a second cameo appearance from a, a favourite guest star of mine. Who? The shark from Jaws. Ah, yes, we had a, a long <laughs> discussion. Previously, was it um, Try and Catch Me, I think we saw him before? Nope. Nope. No, no. Fade into Murder, I think it, the episode was? Yes, he was down on the set, just randomly. Season 6, I want Sounds to about say. right. Sounds about right. We have a... A jaunty score here. Definitely upbeat. You've got tourists on this ride or this tour. Um, immediate credits rolling. Everything's kind of cheerful. But then there's a, a fellow at the back that's not quite so cheery. It doesn't appear to be enjoying the theme park as much as everyone else. He seems to be there on other business. Yeah, you wonder why he's bothered to join this tour. Yeah. The chap you're referring to is the Leonard Fisher that you mentioned in the summary. He is. And he is here to see Alex Brady. Yes, who we've not been introduced to quite yet. Not quite yet. We get to Alex shortly, but before we arrive there, we see some fabulous city sets. Yeah. You know, like old New York or whatever it's meant to be. It appears to be an active working film studio. Yeah. We go behind the scenes to a soundstage, I think it's called. It looks like that. You've got this fellow arrives in what looks like a modified golf buggy. And that is Alex Brady. It is. And he's here to meet his friend or colleague, Stan. Yes. Now, Stan is showing him some new holographic 3D trickery of a a woman. It's not quite perfected yet. No, it's not clear from the the shop what's wrong with it, but it's, it's not, they're not happy. Now, as he leaves, Alex Brady that is, as he leaves this studio, uh, this soundstage, the tour guide passes by. Yeah, just before that, we've had kind of the Colombo tradition of kind of jumping back between the two. Yeah. So we see the ride carrying on. We see Alex and Stan testing different effects mm-hmm. on their on their stage. And as the ride reaches the building, Alex Brady comes out, and the people on the tour wave at him. Yep, they are introduced by the the guide. Yeah. 
explaining who he is. And we, we find out that Alex Brady is the current flavour of the month, or he's a yeah. hot shot young director. The new Spielberg. That's exactly who it's meant to be, isn't it? Not the not the first time Spielberg's come up in the No, in the I, show. this is again obviously a nod to Spielberg who directed Murder by the Book. Yes, and was referenced in Mind Over Mayhem. Mm. We hear he is the most successful special effects director around and he has many, many hit movies. Yeah, he seems to be a success, which we might come back to later yes, on. Yes, I have an issue with that. I mean, if he is so powerful, there's a couple of scenes, one in particular, where he's been threatened with his movie being pulled. But if you can imagine that being whoever the, the current hotshot director is, if you've had five or six movies that are huge successes, and your current backer on this movie pulls out, you'll be signed up by anyone else immediately. Yeah, yeah. you would be. You wouldn't, you wouldn't simply say, oh, you've not had this movie made, therefore, go away. No, I don't think so. I think, well, we'll come to that near the end of the episode, but mm-hmm. it doesn't quite mesh. We then see Leonard get off the back of the tour vehicle just outside uh, Alex Brady's studio apartment. It's a strange room. They refer to it the cup? as the boys' room. Mm-hmm. Boys', boys room or the boys' club or the goof-off place. Or, yeah. Yeah. It just seems to be an area that he can relax and work in. Mm-hmm. I think those are... I think that's a, a real thing. If you're sure. one of the, the top stars, and again, thinking back to Requiem for a Fallen Star, the uh, the leading lady had a, an apartment on, on the studio set. Sure. I mean, he's also got an office elsewhere, but yeah, yeah, this is his, maybe his creative area. Mm. So we get into this studio home, this clubhouse. Yeah. And we can see immediately it's been designed for a, a young man. Yeah, there's all sorts of movie accoutrement around yeah. the, the room. So old-fashioned sort of soda machines and games and posters and arcade-type things. A fun place, you'd have thought. Yeah, yeah. And he, he's working because he's brought with him the special effect reel that he and Stan were looking at. Yeah. He puts this on and he seems quite pleased with his work. Yeah, I think, again, it's something they're making progress on. Mm-hmm. As he is watching this, we see the door open behind him, and Leonard enters. Yeah, and unnoticed. Yes, but after a beat, Alex acts pleased to see him. Yeah, he, he addresses him as Lenny, and he says, you come to town, you don't write, you don't mm. call. Lenny, <laughs> what sort of accent was that? That was the exact accent that he used. If you play that against the episode, that's how you speak. If you play it backwards when you're drunk. You get a a really nice recipe for lentil soup. Yes. Leonard or Lenny is very tense. He's not a relaxed chap. Clearly uptight, agitated, Mm. whatever word you want to use, yeah. Mm. He first breaks some bad news. He tells Alex that their childhood friend, known as Buddy, has died recently. And he also reminds him about his own sister, Jenny. Yeah, who died sometime previous. He, he says that Buddy's died of hepatitis. I wonder if that was a a, a euphemism for AIDS. Why? Because it's been made in the 80s and this was kind of the big thing at the time. And they maybe were working around it. Could be. I, I don't know of any reason to think that other than like the times. What, what if he'd said he died of cancer? Would that also be a euphemism? No, for- I don't think so. It's a different sort of thing. Okay. Anyway, Alex gets quite defensive. And he says that Jenny's death and the whole that whole scenario was a long time ago. Let's not dwell on it. I think he tries to uh, distract him and change the, the subject matter, doesn't he? It's a strange one because it seems an odd thing to bring up. Well, it would to Alex, but it's been brought up, obviously, by Leonard for very... A specific purpose, yeah. Mm-hmm. So to move things along, they decide to toast ice cream sodas to, to Buddy and Jenny. Yeah, at this point I got the impression that perhaps Lenny blames Buddy and Alex for the accident. Maybe he's killed Buddy mm. and now he's here to finish Alex as well. Okay. Obviously not true. No. But that was the kind of first thought that I had there. Sure. Again, we we, we can really feel and sense Lenny's his tension, his uh, apprehension or his... I think his anxiety. I think yeah. he's scared of what he's about to do. Yeah. He's focused and obviously has an issue with his sister's death. He keeps wanting to discuss this and remind him of the the accident. Yeah, and we, we learn soon that there's a more specific reason for that. Now, we learn this because Lenny then produces a film that was given to him by Buddy shortly before he died. 
It seems a little bit of an odd thing for Buddy to have done without any provocation from Alex. If he's covered it up till just before his own death and then to drop his friend in it because he's dying anyway. Yes, in fairness, it could be that Buddy has lived with guilt for the remainder of his life and on this sort of deathbed. If he's dying from illness, he's got time to reflect and well, he thinks, I want to put things right now. Actually, I can't hide this. Lenny deserves to know or, or Alex deserves to be brought to justice for this. I can't, I can't, I don't want to die with this. It seems quite a selfish thing then because he's managed to avoid justice himself by waiting till he's almost dead and then he's just dropped somebody in it. But it wasn't anything to do with him. He was there as well. He's holding the camera. I don't think it's any more to do with Alex than it is to do with Buddy. They were both there film making the film and it was an accident and she died and they both left her. That's true actually. Yeah. So it seems to be, it's quite a selfish thing. And from my point of view, it seems to have been quite a selfish thing that Buddy's done there. That's a fair to drop point. Alex in it. Yeah, fair enough. So Lenny has this this piece of film, yeah, and he wants them both to watch it together. Yeah, what it shows is that Jenny was working with Alex when she died, despite apparently her brother Lenny forbidding her to act in this role. Yeah, and also the fact that the the official story they gave was that she had died on the way to making this film. Yeah. It, it doesn't seem like the most violent of accidents that's killed her there. No, it doesn't. When you watch it back, it was a I mean, I suppose... It's like something out of a silent movie. You expect her to kind of sit up in the next frame and go, yeah. you know, oh my goodness, that was shocking. Sure. You could have made it more graphic and obvious. Although... Or left it to the imagination. Yeah. But the crux of it is, is that, as you say, she didn't die on her own on the way there to this uh, making this short movie. Yeah. She died when performing and Alex left her to die alone. Well, Lenny's come to this conclusion. It's not clear from the video if she's already dead or just dying, but... Well, we find out, I think, that she died later. She bled to death. Yeah. So, Lenny, he is rightly distraught. At this point, I'm thinking, well, which of them's going to kill which? Hmm. Because it could go either way. Sure. So he didn't recognise the the bad guy? I'm aware of him, but I didn't know which... Who, what he looked like, or you know, I had, it was, I'm not so sure that I didn't know. It just wasn't in my mind when I was watching the episode. Okay. In any case, Lenny threatens Alex. He is going to ruin him. There was no accident along the way. Your stunt went out of control. She was bleeding to death, and you, yeah, left her. You, you just left her there. You didn't try to help. You ran away, and you left her to die. Alex, was that because of Mr. Morasco? Because you were afraid your wonderful new good luck would run out if he ever found out what she did to her? So I tell you, I choked on it, Alex. I, I couldn't tell anyone, not, not until I could face you. Lenny. And I'm glad that you're such a terrific success. I tell you, I'm, I'm glad you, you got everything you got because I'm going to turn it all into garbage. You bastard, Alex, I'll... I ran that picture in every scandal sheet, in every newspaper. I'll see it. I'll see that film on every on every TV news show until you choke on it too. It isn't true, Lenny. No, and the cops and the prosecutors. Okay, until you climb into your grave like it's some one of your new fancy sports cars, Alex. That's what I came here to tell you, Len. It isn't. Re- yeah, apologies to anyone offended by the language in that clip. If it's good enough for Columbo, it's good enough for us. <laughs> we'll not make a habit of it. But Alex is trying to stall here. Yes. What did you think about the the motive then? We can discuss it at the end of the episode, but pretty strong yeah. in the sense that revenge for your for the uh, perceived responsibility cult, yeah. for the death of the sister. Yeah, yeah. I guess you can see where he came to. Well, that's yeah. His motive for coming to Alex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it seems. Fairly reasonable. Mm. And he drops in that internally unrealistic but necessary for the plot line. I've not told anybody before I could face you. Yeah. See, that's the thing again. You wouldn't necessarily believe that, would you? You wouldn't do that. No, you wouldn't do it. And even then... In fact, I don't think he has done that because I think we find that later there's a copy of the tape somewhere else. Yes. And you also have to assume that Buddy would only have told Lenny about this then. You know, Buddy might have told someone else. He could else. have told anybody, yeah. Alex has to think on his feet. He tells him that Buddy, for some reason, has faked this movie. He tries to bamboozle Lenny with 
technical stuff, doesn't he? He tells him about the grain and the shadow, all this type of stuff. So it's an obvious fake. Yeah, it doesn't look like a fake. No, it doesn't. Well, it does because the accident doesn't seem very realistic, but yeah. So Lenny reluctantly agrees to give Alex a few hours to prove that he is innocent. Alex says he's going to go and get some experts and come back and and prove this. It's all been a setup. So Alex leaves and Lenny stays in the, the apartment. Yeah, and the, Lenny the insists on keeping the film with him. Mm-hmm. Which he would do. Why Lenny hangs around at this point, I don't know. What do you mean? Like why he waits for Alex to come back. I think that he would love... He's emotionally distraught here, isn't he? So I, I, I'm thinking that in this state, any glimmer that his childhood friend did not kill or was not culpable for the death of his sister, he's clinging on to that, isn't he? He doesn't want to believe it. Could be, I suppose, yeah. Give him a chance here. Leonard Fisher was played by Jeff Perry. He was born in 1955. He has been in Nash Bridges, Prison Break, Lost, My So-Called Life, and currently is in Scandal, or was in Scandal, I'm not sure if it's still going. He is the former husband of Laurie Metcalf, who was Roseanne's sister in Roseanne. Oh, right, okay. Jackie, was that her name? Can't remember. Mm -hmm. She's also in uh, Big Bang Theory as well. Don't watch that. So we go to Alex's main office, his proper business office. Yeah, he's got a secretary and everything. Rose, yeah. She tells him that uh, the Mr... Morosco, that we heard in the clip there, who is his mentor and backer, his... Yeah, I don't really I don't get really this relationship know. and how he... It was in that clip as well. Leonard accused Alex of not doing anything and not saying anything because maybe Mr. Morosco would not be happy. Yeah, it appears he's a some kind of sponsor or mentor that's identified him as talented as a young yeah. man. But what I don't get is, originally, what was... Why would Alex not help Jenny? It's an accident. They've got, they've got this on, yeah. on this film. It's an accident. It's an accident. They're making a movie, right? So why yeah. would he not do anything? Because maybe he thinks his Hollywood deal is going to fall through if he's associated with a death on set. I don't think that. That doesn't seem very it doesn't, realistic It at may all. not be rational, but he might be worried about that in the moment. Unless, of course, he doesn't have the necessary insurance, etc., and shouldn't have been doing this. Well, that's entirely possible, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, Rose, the secretary informs Alex that this Mr. Morosco has called a few times and also that a, a female called Ruth has been waiting on him in his office for the past 10 minutes. Well, we've seen her in Three Dimensions a little earlier. Yes, we have. There's another fellow there as well. A Phil Crosetti. Is that his name? Something along those lines. And it becomes obvious that Phil has been up to some sort of shenanigans by the sound of the conversation. And Alex thanks him for his work before he leaves. Yeah, it's a strange one, and I think it's entirely unfortunate from Alex's point of view that Phil and um, Ruth are here at the same time. We certainly come to learn that is the case. Yeah. So inside the office, Ruth and Alex kiss, and it transpires that they have an on-off relationship. They had a relationship, and then it seems he has cooled on it while working. Yeah, it appears she wants more from him. At least more attention. Yeah, and I think my understanding would be that he's focused on his career and doesn't want to give her the time. Perhaps he doesn't have the time. Yeah, he's probably happy enough if she's there when it's convenient for him. In fairness, if you're in your early 20s, hot shot Hollywood director, you know, at that stage in your life, focus on your career. You know, Absolutely. Have girlfriends, etc., but you shouldn't be. I don't think she, it's fair that she's demanding his time and attention. When well, I think it's fair enough for her to want that, but it's also fair enough for him to say, well, I'm not prepared to offer that. He claims he's too busy at the present time, and she leaves unhappily. Yeah, she's not in any way cheating. Mm-hmm. Alex then calls someone at the sort of maintenance department of the studio and orders a wet down on brownstone in one hour's time. So Brownstone is the name of the street, like there in Brooklyn. Yeah. yeah, Brooklyn, isn't it? That's the Brownstone houses. Possibly. Alex then returns to pick up Lenny from the clubhouse. Yeah, the boys' club, or how are we going to call mm-hmm. it? Yeah. He has the film, and he takes him to the Brownstone set. Yeah, and he says he's going to kill him. It gets a bit surreal here, doesn't it? This 
is the first of a number of odd scenes, but yes. Alex goes from playful to psychotic. And then back. Yeah, in a very overly dramatic manner. Len gets frightened and starts to run. I mean, I assume that's deliberate from Alex. He's wanting to make this guy run and Mm. then essentially um, kill himself. Yes. He's chased by Alex and we see a a truck wet down the, the street. That's quite risky and chancy, isn't it? Having the truck out, wetting down the street at the same time you're chasing a guy down a dark dark Yeah, set. it's an odd one, isn't it? Yeah. Lenny then grabs a, a metal gate and is promptly... Oh, um, he's uh, zapped. He certainly is. And when he falls to the ground, Alex unplugs the, the power cable and places it in the trunk of a car along with <laughs> a sledgehammer and Lenny's body. Yes. Subtle. Mm-hmm. Alex then leaves in a car and goes past the security guard. He does, and interestingly, there's a storm brewing at this point, which yeah. Columbo will mention later on. Mm-hmm. We return the next morning to the clubhouse. We do. And Alex is annoyed to find Columbo's car parked in his space, the house. He's further annoyed when he goes in the house to find Columbo playing with his toys. A train set, which reminds you of... Uh, being a young boy in the early learning centre. Oh, <laughs> bye bye, sky high. Of course, yes. And he was in there playing with the train set. He was. Mm-hmm. Columbo IDs himself. Yeah, actually, it reminded me more of the conspirators with the pinball. Sure, just kind of going and using somebody else's stuff. <laughs> Alex again has to act very quickly on his feet, and I think his response is fantastic. Well, his initial response, I think, is quite telling, but he covers himself. How did you know? Know what, sir? You are the answer to a filmmaker's prayers. <laughs> In my business, the film business, we're always working with the same people over and over, and we never, hardly ever, break out of our own self-centered little circle. But to meet somebody wonderfully new, an authentic plumber, a real chemist, or praise God, a homicide lieutenant, you know, it's funny. I've been thinking about making a detective movie. <laughs> you know, I would like to take this straw and stick it in your ear and extract everything you've ever thought or felt or seen or even dreamed about your profession. And I bless whatever it is that brought you here to me. Oh, here, sit down, Lieutenant. Please sit down. I'm interested to hear anything you want to tell me. And you see you're, you're impressed with his, his cover, I think, it- He's already given himself away by the time he gets to his story. Potentially. When I say I'm impressed, I'm just impressed by the performance. Right. Not necessarily the reality of what he's saying. What did you think of Fisher Stevens' performance as Alex O'Brady? I actually thought he was quite believable in the role. I thought he, he um, gave the impression he understood film sets and was authentic mm-hmm. from my perspective. I mean, I've never been around film directors, but that's, it's made sense to me. Yeah. No, I, I loved the performance. I thought it was great. One of the strong points. I think it was actually the sort of charisma of his performance is why I enjoy this episode so much or have done. Also, I think the fact that when I watched it as a kid, I might have, wa- I might have watched this in the, along the sort of the first the first run of it because it would have been, what, 89, 90? Mm-hmm. And I would have been old enough to be watching this sort of live as it were. Even with the bad language. Even with the bad language. You are quite old, I suppose. <laughs> Not that old. I would have been... Eight and a bit, maybe nine. Yeah, you know. I mean, that, that would have been on. You know, wouldn't have been. Wouldn't have been post watershed. No, I don't suppose. Maybe Sunday morning TV. Yeah, yeah. Sunday afternoon. Alex Brady, played by Fisher Stevens. He was born in 1963 as Stephen Fisher, but there already was a Stephen Fisher, so he called himself Fisher Stevens. Reasonable. Hmm. He played Ben in Short Circuit One and Two, quite controversially these days. Really? Yeah. Why is that? Have you watched any of those movies? Not since the 80s, maybe early 90s. Okay, but you did watch it. Is that on Your Mum Was a Snowblower? What? 25. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but that's not... The reason it's controversial... You must remember why it was controversial then. No. Okay, who did he play? I can't remember. He played the Indian. Did he? Yes. And he's clearly not Indian. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. I, I, I don't remember it well enough to... Yeah, that's quite... Looking back now... At the time it wasn't, but I think... Everyone now looking back and watching it, thinking you've got Alec, you've got uh, Fisher Stevens putting on a being browned up and putting on a funny accent to play 
an Indian. A bit like a case of immunity. Yeah, uh, yes, but they didn't actually brown them up. I think actually they put makeup on Fisher Stevens to make him look brown. Does that make it worse? Yeah. Okay. Ask Al Jolson. <laughs> okay, so uh, he also now again you, you, don't rec- you said you didn't recognise, but I know for a fact that you like the Grand Budapest Hotel. Yes. So he was in that. Yeah, I read that. Um, I can't remember his character. I think he was one of the other um, sort of hotel staff. Okay. He has been in Elementary, Lost, Early Edition, and another great movie, <laughs> Hackers. Not seen that. Yeah, a hacking movie from the early 90s with Angelina Jolie and uh, Johnny Lee Miller. Right. It's, got a, it's a bit of a cult following now. Right. Nonsense, but good. Good fun. Okay, uh, the only hacking movie I remember is with Matthew Broderick. And yes. Yeah, I can't remember what that was called, but... I can. War Games. <laughs> oh, you're taking credit for it? Yeah. <laughs> that was with, um, what do you call her? Ali Sheedy. Right. Fisher Stevens also won an Oscar in 2010. Did he? Yes. What That's for? a best documentary, The Cove. Not seen it. Not watched but that. So, an Oscar winner. There you go. Mm-hmm. Maybe you learned from this episode what it's like to be a director. Back to the, the plot. Columbo sits down beside Alex on a beanbag. He struggles with that. He does. In this episode, we mentioned last week that the humour, the comedy wasn't quite, didn't hit the notes, the right notes. What did you think about this week? There were a few touches. This scene in particular. I don't know. Because he was being serious out with those Mm -hmm. moments. They didn't, they kind of jarred a wee bit with the rest of the scene. They were were nice moments, but they did, for me, they didn't fit with the scene. Okay. I thought, I thought it did because we're in this clubhouse, this boys' club. Everything is quite, you know, it's not a, a stern office with a, a 40 or 50 year old, you know, businessman. Yeah. He's playing along to this sort of young. Yeah, you can understand what he's doing. He's trying to kind of put the guy at ease. and... I think, yeah, what he's doing here is that he is making himself look to be an old furry duddy against this young to try and make him uh, underestimate him. It's a slightly different method. From what you used in the seventies, because in the like you talked about in the seventies, um, we got to the episode of the last one where somebody was older than him. Yeah. So now he's got this new, yeah, sort of weapon in his arsenal. He can play the whole out of touch old fellow who doesn't know what's going on. Definitely. In any case, Columbo can't quite get a handle on the beanbag, so he tries the waterbed. Uh, we had a clip of that off that at the top of the show. Yeah, he can't. He can't quite get to grips with that either, can he? He's not there for long. No. Columbo gets back to the more pressing and serious matter and he tells uh, Alex that they they found this this body. Yeah, they're struggling to identify the body because its face has been smashed in. Yeah, it was found on a beach. And as you say, his face was smashed in and he was electrocuted. Yeah, they've got the cause of death, so they've worked that out. But then, why has he come to visit Alex? Yes. Also, there are no fingerprints. They were burned off by the electrocution. And his hands were also all burned and he had nothing in his pockets. So Columbo's got nothing to go on. That's why he is here. It's almost an identical initial lead to the one we saw in The Conspirators. Yes. There's a book. So he's gone to the author. Or the subject in this case. Yeah. So Columbo explains that the only lead he has is a book that was found nearby, and it was a book about the films of Alex Brady. Well, how was that found nearby? That's what I want to know. What do you mean, how was it found nearby? Well, why did Alex leave it lying around? He didn't. We show this later on. We see this later on uh, when Columbo's down at the beach and he's reenacting it. He lifts the, the body over his shoulder. And it comes out. And he f- notices that the, the book falls out of his pocket, and Alex Brady would not have noticed that, potentially. But if he's taking everything else out, I suppose unless he waited till he was down on the beach before taking everything out of his pockets. Yeah. The other thing as well, Alex Brady, Fisher Stevens, is not the biggest of chaps. And Lenny is a good deal bigger, I think, he would than have been him. struggling with him. Very much so. But it just seems like he's quite precise in some areas and quite mm-hmm. sloppy in others. In fact, it's a little bit, the whole beach thing reminds me a bit of identity crisis where the guy's plan gets yeah. aborted. Alex claims that there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of books um, of his books so it, it doesn't see how that he can help and that's a reasonable response absolutely but Columbo tells Alex there is something else and as he says this he notices that Alex replaces a book that was on the shelf yeah Columbo then shows him his own direct dial number 
written in the book cover. And Alex then admits that he gets strange calls all the time from fans and amateur filmmakers. Which is again a reasonable... I think it's perfectly reasonable. I think if someone was buying a book about him, they may well go to the length of finding out his phone number. Sure. It's not like it's a mobile number nowadays where it's something really personal. It's just his office number. Well, it's a direct dial number. Yeah, but still, I think it would be available. You'd be able to get it sure. from somewhere. So Colombo thanks him and he leaves, but we have a one more thing. <laughs> yes, we do. Which is? He wants to know if Alex is serious about making a detective movie because he's about to school him in the art of detecting. He is. He firstly, you know, he doubts that his work is very interesting yeah. in the first place. He says, the kind of work I do, I don't think it's as interesting as you think it is. No. But he then goes on to extract some very accurate information from the two ice cream glasses that they toasted, previously they toasted uh, Jenny and, and, and Buddy with. He's got a lot of data out of those. Yes. Alex acts very impressed with the deductions, but he smashes the glasses in a rage just after Columbo again leaves. Yeah, it's almost Sherlock-esque, some of this scene. Yes. This, or this moment, where mm-hmm. you know, he sees a little thing and he tells you the whole story. But then he smashes the glasses and Columbo has obviously been standing just on the other side of the door. He comes back in again. Yes, to ask if he was right about the deductions that he made. Yeah, and he gets told close enough. Yes. Columbo surely must have heard that smash. Yes, he did. I think he already knows he's got his killer. From the, how did you know, at the start. This is like back, uh, like last week, so this is pure magic. No, no, no. I think he followed his initial lead and then the guy essentially confessed the first time he opened his mouth. Okay. We go to the main office, or Alex's main office. Yeah, some interesting music here as well. It's quite prominent music. A little tinkle of this old man. Mm. As Columbo pulls up beside a, a Rolls Royce. And what does he do? He talks to the dog. He gives his own car a little polish. Does he? Yes. He looks at the Rolls Royce, looks at his own car, and gives his a little buff. Yeah. Yeah. A nice little touch. There's, there's a few scenes like with the car and with the dog that I kind of feel are just in so that the car and the dog are in the episode. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I believe that. But why not? Yeah. So Colombo enters and Rose is harassed. She has no record and can't understand why Alex had apparently ordered the water truck the previous night. Yep. And not told her. Mm, exactly. Colombo takes a weather report and he mentions that he always likes to check if he really will need his raincoat or not. Twice in this episode he mentions his uh-huh. raincoat. Yeah. I'm not sure why it's suddenly in his mind, but anyway. Rose is generally unhappy besides the specific unhappiness with not being told about the water truck. Yes. And she confirms that she only keeps uh, call records for personal and business calls, not calls from fans. Yeah, and Colombo goes to look at the record and then realises he has no idea what he's looking for. So we go to the ACM studios. Well, before that, though, there's a funny little bit in this scene because she keeps calling him Inspector. Yes. And he has to explain to her, you don't have inspectors no. anymore. <laughs> It's like when an inspector calls. Oh, J.B. Priestley. That's the one. Good version of that on the BBC not so long ago. Yeah, I seen that. Uh, I read the book and I also saw it uh, on the stage as well. Yeah, it was. That's a good thing. What's your opinion? Is he real? Whether or not he's real, it's the it's the admissions, isn't it? It's, uh, it's the, yeah, accepting or understanding that what we do actions. affects other people, yeah. not just ourselves. Yeah. Oh, go. So we go to ACM Studios, and that's the workplace of uh, Mr. Marasco. Yeah, we've heard about him a couple of times. He's the fellow that kind of got Alex's career kick-started. Yeah. He's not very happy, is he? Well, the board are all over him. They want a new movie this Easter. Yeah. Alex says that he can't do that. But he says, you know, blame me. Tell the, the board that I'm a temperamental young director. Alex is very unreasonable. He is. He doesn't seem to appreciate or understand the... Uh, the pressure or the situation that Morosco's in. Well, yeah, he's failing to read Morosco's body language and his tone and his... Mm. It, you know, he's not getting the picture. And that's going to come back to haunt him, isn't it? Well, yes. From there we head to the beach. <laughs> yes, with a, a chalk outline in the sand. Yeah. And Colombo ponders and then reenacts the moving of the body from the trunk to the beach. And it, this shows, as I mentioned, how the book could have fallen out. This reminded me a lot of, do you remember the first Naked Gun movie? Mm-hmm. He goes down to the beach and the chocolate line's in the sea. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another cop 
shows up and he gives Columbo Lenny's belt. And Columbo notices something, something not ordinary. Yeah, it's not obvious to us at this moment. No. And it, it wasn't obvious to me even when he showed it because it's not something I'm familiar with. Really? Had you not heard of that before? No. Oh, away you go. No. You've not heard of a money belt? I've heard of that, but I just thought that was another word for a bum bag. No. Or a fanny pack, as yeah, you call it in go. America. There you go. You learn something new every day then, don't yeah. you? I've learned that you didn't know what a money belt was. That's it. <laughs> we, um... It just it seems a bit inconvenient. You have to take your belt off to get your money every time you go to a till. No. You wouldn't use it. That's an emergency stash in case you're robbed. So when you're travelling, right. you would have a money belt, especially if you're, yeah. So you'd put, you know, whatever sure reserves. robbers would know about that and just take belts well, did you, of people. You, no, you didn't know about it, did you? I didn't know about it, but I'm not. Most robbers that hold you up and say, give me your wallet and, you know, you've got 30 seconds and they want to head off. They're not going to tell you to strip and give you your belt in case you're, you're wearing a money belt. But they would if they thought there was money in it. Yeah, but most people don't carry money belts. That's the whole point. Mm, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking of a robber somewhere at home with 40 belts. <laughs> 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 Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Shaking the light. <laughs> uh, we head back to Alex's personal house. Yeah. And his, pers- his house. His house, yeah. <laughs> his <personal> house. <laughs> his personal house as opposed to the clubhouse. Yeah, okay. Uh, Ruth's there and she asks Alec, Alex who Phil is. She's seen him around. And Alex claims he's just some bit part actor. Yeah, my notes on this scene are, this scene is terrible, like something from a terrible 80s movie, this is terrible, and I've written that about seven times in a row. Well, that's odd, because my first note here I've got is, nice little scene where Ruth... (laughs) 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 Nice little scene where Ruth explains how she had an affair in order to try and make Alex jealous, but admits that it didn't work out like that. Yeah, she ended up getting hurt, and so on, blah, blah, blah. A uh, kiss is interrupted by a knock at the door. <laughs> Thank goodness, Columbo <laughs> showed up. Columbo enters with great news, and Ruth leaves. Yeah, that's the great news. What, that Ruth leaves? Yes. No, you don't like her? Well, just I didn't like that scene, I was glad it was over. I'm not saying that I like the scene, but I like that. Oh, well, I did write, nice little scene. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> okay, each to their own. Yeah. The news that Columbo has for Alex is that he has identified who the John Doe from the beach is. And he, yeah. He's done this from a, a money belt that had a traceable traveller's check yeah, inside. Yeah, it's quite nice the way that he shows Alex the belt. Yeah, he make, he doesn't just come out and tell, okay, well, what does he do? He loads it on the model railway and drives it round. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a traveller's check, yeah, but it's got a code and they know it's uh, Leonard Fisher. And we can see, not for the first time, but Alex is starting to get Edgy well, and he's annoyed. thinking, he's trying to work out, well, how do I play this? What yeah. do I do now? And he has to accept that he knows Leonard Fisher and he's upset. He talks about Jenny. Yeah, he's forced to... Uh, this is, I think, the third time where he's he's been forced to think in his feet. And this is where Columbo gets them because they must have started to lie. It's hard to keep it going. Sure. Lenny's was the body you found? What a remarkable coincidence, sir. You actually knew him? Coincidence is what makes a story, Lieutenant. Without coincidence, life runs evenly, like like a train on a track. Coincidence is a train wreck. Violence and suffering and guilt. Guilt, sir? Lenny's sister, Jenny, was killed about 10 years ago in a freak accident. She was on her way to meet me. Me. No me, no accident, no dead Jenny. And no Lenny, too. There's an unusual finish to this scene. Very, uh, but not... We you say unusual, it's inappropriate. Well, Columbo says, can I make an ice cream... Sh-? I mean, did you say they were at his personal home? Because Columbo asks to make an ice cream soda. And I thought the ice cream soda stuff was at the clubhouse. You're correct, this is a clubhouse. It must be. So Columbo asks if he can make an ice cream soda, and Alex leaves. So essentially Columbo then starts searching without a warrant. It's a... Uh, he's bending the rules here. It's a great area. But he does recover a critical piece of evidence. Yes, but just like in the, the, the Sky High... Bye bye Sky High with the umbrella. If you come across it, you can say, I was invited to have an ice cream soda. 
I was, I was, you know, just looking around. I was looking through some books on a shelf. I wasn't, I wasn't going through drawers. This is a book, a bookshelf. You wasn't conducting an illegal search. No, just looking at books on a shelf. Except he knew what he was looking for. Well, he doesn't necessarily have to admit that he knew what he was looking for. Because you mentioned earlier, he saw that mm. particular book being replaced yeah. on yeah. the shelf. It's a great area. Okay. He, he said, yeah, unusual, but it's not unusual, is it? It's Columbo being inappropriate. If we assume. I suppose that he is convinced that this is the killer, then that's a different matter. Well, I think he is convinced. But if he's not the killer, then you're messing about with someone whose friend has just died and you're asking to be drinking and making ice cream. Yeah, so even mentioning ice cream. Yeah, your friend's dead. Oh, his sister died. Can I yeah. have an ice cream? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it wasn't just as if, it wasn't the fact that he asked for it. He said, oh, is there anything I can do for you? Yeah, there's something. But, but it's not the best time, you know. Forcing him to ask you what you want. Yeah. As Columbo is doing this, we see Alex leave and admonish himself in the car for being so stupid. Yeah, I think he understands it's all falling apart now. And the book that Columbo looks at on the shelf is, did you mention the yearbook? The college yearbook. Yes. We'll come back the next day. We're on the studio set. Filming's underway and Columbo and Dog show up in the car. Like I said before, I think just to get Dog in the episode. Yeah. People, that's what the fans want. Yes, give them, even if it's not the same dog, bring him back. <laughs> Did you recognise his face this time, Ian? I assume it's not the same dog, because it's not an old looking dog. Okay. How how old would you say this dog looked? About the same age as the one that we saw in 1978. You think so? <laughs> roughly. <If> you like, <laughs> roughly. <laughs> Very good. Uh, if only you'd met that. Anyway. Alex is on one of these uh, crane chairs, which raises you up and down and swivels you around so you can direct from different heights. Yeah. Columbo has newspaper clippings regarding Jenny's death. Yeah. And he tells, he shouts up to Alex who's on the chair that he has no reason to feel guilt. There was nothing that he could have done. Yeah, but he adds in the mm. little light thing that shows he knows the truth, I think. Which is? It would be different if she was working on your film. <laughs> yeah. That seemed a little... See, how would Columbo know that? If he hadn't already seen the tape of it. Yeah. We must assume he has already seen the tape of it, I think. You think so? Well, otherwise, why would he say that? Colombo magic? Hmm. Massive leap that is accurate? Fortunate guess. Yeah. Maybe. He then asks if he can join him on the crane. And we have another trope here, don't we? Of Colombo being deliberately made to feel uncomfortable by the killer on a, a vehicle. Yeah, I think it was it Blue Danube Waltz starts playing in the background, something like was that. Was that what it was, yeah? Some kind of waltz, anyway. And he's <laughs> getting swung around up and down yeah. and left and right and looks visibly nauseous. Yeah, you would do. It's quite a lot, of, it's quite a, a padded scene, this, isn't it? It's a little bit like that one in Make Me a Perfect Murder yeah. where he just presses the button one time too many. Yeah, it's like that with regards to it being padding. However, I would much rather watch this scene. Yeah, than this was better. I just think it's like maybe one manoeuvre more than they needed yeah. to have there. <laughs> and Columbo mentions to him while this is happening about the ordering of the watering down of the Brownstone Street. Yeah, he's kind of fobbed off with just criticism of Rose. He's, I think Alex says something like, Rosie gets upset about paper clips these days mm. and we don't make allowances for age. <laughs> so the, the, the direction finishes the... They come back down and the crew and Alex leave and Columbo's on his own and he very, very, very fortuitously notices the power cable leading to the fence and part of a shoe heel. Well, that's again a sloppy thing to have left behind. Very sloppy. Yeah. Fortuitous insofar as there's a door banging and there's nothing behind the door. Yeah. And then he follows this cable. He touches the the gate, Uh. which he thinks has electrocuted somebody. (laughs) Yeah. Um... Do we know it's a heel at this point? I mean, we can't really see it uh, on the, the screen, but I'm um, assuming that if I had to pick up a heel and look at it close up, I would recognise it for what it was. Yeah, we'll find out soon enough anyway. Mm-hmm. So we're back to a studio set, and Columbo again is making a nuisance of himself, and he is rewarded by being shot at by spaceships and being placed on a boat in the middle of a storm. Yeah, he gets asked, what's he doing in the middle of my desert? Yeah. <laughs> this is a show-off of the special effects and then... It's a bit of fun, isn't it? Really? Yeah, and Stan leaves. But the point of this scene is that Alex cannot explain why Lenny would not have been in touch whilst in LA. 
He then tries to disorientate and confuse Columbo with his lights and his shadows and a white picket fence. Yeah. Light and shadow, Lieutenant. Am I trapped behind the fence? Or are you? Or are we trapping each other? Shall we? Why don't we try to escape from all this, Lieutenant? Well, it should be easy to find a way out. Not if we reverse the action. See? We're still locked with each other. Now our film's making its own reality. And there's no end to the fence. We could always just back away from each other, sir. Back away and you lose your light. Without light, you die. Your picture dies. And you've lost your murder case, Lieutenant. You've left the world of your own reality, Lieutenant. Now you're in my world. Now you're living in my reality. And you've lost your substance. You're a shadow on my screen. An illusion without reality, sir? But I think I'm very real. What's real and what isn't? We do our tricks with smoke and mirrors. The mirrors are real, so is the smoke. But is the fence real, Lieutenant? Oh, oh, I'm pretty sure about that, sir. Clouds of atomic particles fly through empty space pretending to be a fence. And you call that reality? As real as you are, Mr. Brady. Right. Now you understand. I'm the substance, and you're the shadow. I created you, and I can destroy you. I could vanish you with a word. What word is that, sir? Kill! Yeah. <laughs> is that all you have to say? An unusual moment. I yeah. think quirky. There's a couple of times in this episode where I wonder if we are seeing it through Brady's eyes. Mm-hmm. And it's his imagination or his interpretation of what's actually in front of us that we're seeing. Is this the Matrix stuff here we're talking no, about? No, it's just because he's got this sort of filmmaker's eye and mm-hmm. he sees things in a different way maybe from us and I think maybe they're trying to give us that impression. Different perspective. Um, and then there's a, a moment right at the end that it's a bit odd. We'll get to that. But from here we go to Alex's office and Columbo shows Alex Lenny's shoes, one with a, a missing heel. Yeah. And they agree that it would have been blown off by the electricity, but that it represents no real progress. Columbo accepts this and he exits. But we have a one more thing. We do. Which is? I can't remember. <laughs> He tells Alex that he found a heel. Oh yes, oh, I've got that. And then he found the heel at the gate. At the brownstone. On I just didn't write in that it was one more thing. <laughs> Alex now feels the pressure. I think he already was feeling it a bit, but yes. It's been turned up a notch or two. Absolutely. It's night time. I think we're finally at Brady's actual personal home. That, yes, his personal <laughs> private own home that he owns. He's having a romantic night with Ruth. And she tells him how she met her actor boyfriend Brian. Yeah. So At first I thought this is going to be a really dull one again and I'm starting to doze off but then we get a nice little twist. Okay, explain what her, how her tale turns out. Well, you will recall earlier in this podcast and in the episode we talked about Ruth and Phil unfortunately for Alex coming to his office at the same time. Yeah. Phil was an actor and Alex hired him to play the part of a taxi driver and stage an incident which resulted in Ruth having to go to Brian's door, leading to Ruth and Brian hooking up. The purpose for that being to get her basically off his back, I think, to give him a bit more breathing space. Not just that, I think he, it's alluded to as well, because Ruth and Brian were, were standing together. Yes, opposite each other. Yes. They would improve and their scenes together. Yes, their, 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 their relationship, their, their, perhaps even their lovemaking. On screen. I don't know what type of movie they were making. But who they, knows? Who can tell? She's not best pleased with what he's done. No, she's angered at being treated like a puppet. And she leaves as Alex tries to defend the, the setup. I think he's very much of the opinion that the movie is what matters. If they got better performances and a better shot, a better movie out of it, then it was justifiable. Yes. So she storms out as Columbo enters. Once more. Now, Ruth was played by Molly Hagen. Mm-hmm. She was born in 1961. This is her first of two Columbo episodes. She has starred in Herman's Head, Life's Work, Some Kind of Wonderful, Unfabulous, 
amongst many, many other movie and TV appearances. She's a familiar character actress. She's worked right the way through. She has. She was also in Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Like all the best folks. Mm -hmm. Columbo is acting a little erratically, I think, here. Alex is exasperated with him. He's brought Alex a candy bar. Yeah, which is weird and... Very odd. I mean, you managed to extract from the, the gibbering and the jabbering that he spoke to Lenny's work, or somebody in the police spoke to Lenny's work, and yep. they traced his plane ticket. Mm-hmm. And they found out he was only travelling from, basically from the east coast to the west coast for a day. Yeah. Which is very unusual. That's I mean, that's a long, a long flight. That's going to be a five-hour yeah. flight at least. Yep. Columbo then tells Alex that two acquaintances are about to arrive, a cop and a cab driver. Yeah, Sewell and um, Kim Kardashian's dad. <laughs> yes, Kardashian. It is confirmed that... Well, you know who Kim Kardashian's dad was? Yeah, the O.J. Simpson's lawyer. Yeah. So it's confirmed that Lenny was dropped off at the studio tour centre. And a strained Alex admits that it is baffling that Lenny would have came down or came into town for just one day and not bothered to meet up with him. Yeah, we mentioned this before and I meant to say then, I'm going to say now, this makes no sense. There must be a phone record from when he phoned. Because he wasn't a stranger. You know by now that... No, because Rose said she kept a record of everyone who wasn't a randomer. Friends and business calls were locked. Yep. So we heard, we didn't mention it, but Alex says at the start, Lenny phoned, it was put through to him, and when he answered, it was silent. Yes. So Rose surely logged that call. Yes, but that's discussed later. But he keeps saying, oh, he never got in touch. He never got in touch. Why did he come to LA and not get in touch? But yeah, he must have Columbo assumed that surely Colum- would have seen that name in the book by now. Yeah. yeah. Doesn't anyway, Alex sense. wouldn't know that Columbo knew, but I would have thought that Columbo would be aware by now. It's the middle of the night, and it, the phone goes in Phil's home. He's in bed. Yeah. It's Alex. He wants him to drop by in the morning. See, I know they had to fill the time, but I think the next scene would have worked better if we hadn't had that scene, if we were left to imagine it. Yeah. Or, or at least as well. Yes, I think so. So we're at a, the studio restaurant, and Columbo is eating lunch between two women who won't stop talking. Yeah, but, he's in between them, and they're kind of talking over him, and he offers to swap seats. Mm-hmm. And he overhears their discussion. What are they talking about? One of them says that she used to know Lenny, that she was going with him for a while, and that he called her when he got to town asking if she knew where he could score some coke. (laughs) This is a bit heavy-handed, isn't it? And so Columbo, when he hears this, his ears prick up. And as they leave, Columbo tries to speak with them, but... Uh, They assume that he's trying to crack onto them. Well, the actors are the assume that. And Phil, who's playing the security guard, holds Columbo up for enough time to allow them to disappear. Yeah, acts like they don't believe his police badge is real and so on. And Columbo eventually has to sort of rugby challenge, doesn't he? He has to shoulder challenge. What's your American football? What, what would that be? A drive? What, how would you class that when you charge? Charge, I would imagine. Yeah, is that the word for it? The, the, you watch all that stuff. Yeah. Trucked they, him. When they jump over the, what do you call it, when they're in the, uh. When they, when they jump over the, what do you call it, and they're in the thingy. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> when they're near the, 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 the end zone. Yeah. And they're maybe five yards out. Yeah. And the guy gets the ball and he has to, he just basically tries to leap over them all into the end zone. Yeah, let's call it a dive. A dive. Is that the yeah. technical term for it? He just dives at them. Yeah. Or a leap or a hurdle if you're going over one guy. Anyhow, Colombo, uh, is not able to speak to the, the two women. You know, they're gone. Mm-hmm. Fortunately. But I don't think Columbo's fooled. Nah. We're back to the studio street set, and Alex is happy to hear that Columbo will no longer be around, as the case has taken an unexpected turn, and he will be spending some time with narcotics. That reminded me a little bit of prescription murder, mm-hmm. when he comes off, he pretends to come off the case. Yeah. We head back to a different restaurant, and Rose and Alex are lunching, and he tells her that it's time she found a new job. Yeah. I mean, we find out later, and I think there's been some talk in the forums recently about this as well, Columbo using the killer's technique against them. Mm-hmm. And what we're going to find out later is happening here is that Columbo has 
primed Rose for this conversation. Yes. And she is very much doing his bidding. When you watched this for the first time, yeah. did you understand this was a setup, or did you think Rose was acting in... I thought she was acting in her own interest. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what happens is Rose then plays her trump card and questions why Alex told Columbo that he hadn't spoken to Lenny for years when she knows that he called the other day. And she also mentions a missing call log. Yeah, but she clears up what we were talking about a moment ago. Yes. Alex, on hearing this thinly veiled threat, then has to effectively backtrack and rather than uh, make Rose unemployed, he agrees to pay for her to go on a very long vacation. A cruise, I think. So if he's got the authority to do that, that makes the next scene confusing even further. Why? Well, if he's got the authority for that kind of spending decision, if he's in a position in the studio where he can say, we're spending $5,000, she's going around the world, no one's going to ask any questions and that's going to ha- happen. A very long vacation for one person, even for a month, on a nice cruise liner. Say it was costing you, what, a grand a, a week, two grand a week. Or, say, say the entire thing costs you ten ten thousand dollars Yeah. That's not a lot of money in the movie business. So perhaps he's at a level to sanction ten thousand, fifteen thousand well, dollars spend. That he, it could be he's got a budget to distribute as he sees fit. Yes, that's it. I mean, he's got to... Or, yeah, he hires and fires different... You know, yeah. he, he will have a, a budget probably of millions. Yeah, because he... Even the, the street watering was done at his... Yeah, that'll cost five, five grand or something like that. Yeah, and that's why Rose was unhappy, because he'll have a budget of, say, a million pounds, and she's got to help balance these books. Yeah. So it's coming off that, that, that budget. It's not a lot of money, I suppose, a trip for a month or two. What did this next scene remind you of? Oh, this was uh, in Make Me a Perfect Murder. Yeah, it's almost exactly the same scene, yeah. isn't it? So Explain what happens. Well, Morasco shows up mm-hmm. in a car. Yeah, similar to Make Me a Perfect Murder. Alex joins him in the car Mm -hmm. and is told that the agreement he thought he had is not an agreement at all. It's more of a sort of an understanding. Mm -hmm. There's no pens on paper and there's no agreement anymore. Nope. And he's going to make sure that this movie is never released. But I don't understand how... uh, We said this at the start of the podcast. I really don't understand how this threat works. This is a young Spielberg... Yeah. Say he's after Jaws and after a few things, yeah, after uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Okay, yep. so early in his career, but he's had four or five hits. Who's got the authority to say, ah, yeah. we're not sure on that one? Yeah, why would you want to do that? Like I say, he would go to another studio. And the other thing is, why did the studio care about Marasco's feelings? I mean, he's doing this because he's had his sort of personal issue. Mm-hmm. Essentially, Alex has disrespected him by mm-hmm. rudely responding to his reasonable request. Yeah. That's not the basis for pulling a movie. No. And all he's doing is ruining one movie. It's not like he ruined his career. Wouldn't have thought so. So it's an odd... I, mean, I, don't, I don't understand it. Fair enough, if he was just the new hot shot on the lot and this was his first movie, and therefore, if this doesn't come out... He's yeah. Like, but we're told that he is a, already an established... He's the most successful director At around. Age, yeah, yeah, yeah. Odd. It doesn't add up. No. But Alex clearly believes that Monasco has that power from his reaction. Yeah, he's despondent. We go to the sound stage. But before we do, we didn't mention uh, the actress who played Rose. Yeah. She was played by Nan Martin. She died in 2010, aged 82. She was in Shallow Hall, Nightmare on Elm Street 3, The Drew Carey Show, uh, Mission Impossible, The Defenders, a Tony nominee in 1959, and she was also in Star Trek Next Generation. Who did she play? Don't know. Okay. So, we're off to the sound stage. We are, and I don't think we're going to leave it. Well, Alex isn't as a free man. No. He walks in and angrily tells Stan to lock up the stage. So the picture's been shut down. Yeah. But Stan, rather than disappear immediately... He projects Len's film onto the screen and Columbo appears. Yeah, with Jenny's death playing in the background. Yeah. At this point, Alex dismisses Stan and he, he does go. Stan was played by a chap called Time Winters. 
Born in 1956, he was in Gremlins 2, Murder, She Wrote, MacGyver, Cheers, Doc Hollywood, one of my personal favourites, and Star Trek Next Generation. Doc Hollywood, that's one that's a rip-off of Cars. I think we've had this joke already. <laughs> okay, so, where were we? Columbo's entered. He explains what happened with Jenny's death. He does. But Alex still claims not to have met with Lenny recently. Yeah, Columbo plays out this scenario for him. You know, he wants to know if Lenny threatened him. Mm-hmm. He wants to know what's going on with the water truck. There was rain forecast. Yes, the, the weather report is then produced and it shows uh, rain that evening. So, why did Alex request the street to be wet down? I think his answer's okay. Even with our lack of knowledge about how the movie industry works, um, in LA, you can't guarantee, even if it says it's going to rain, it might not be enough rain, it might not look good in the camera, the streets might not look wet enough. Yeah. So or you it don't, may be really sunny after the rain and yeah, dry up quickly. So you don't rely on nature. Yeah. We get onto the shoe. Yeah, Columbo then produces the heel and shoe, which are a perfect fit, and he then brings out the yearbook in which Columbo found a bookmark. And the bookmark was, in fact, a studio ticket, or a studio tour ticket, time-stamped at uh, the time just after Lenny was dropped off by the the cab driver. Jim Kardashian, yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Columbo claims that this is proof that Lenny was there that day and that he murdered him. I don't think that it's proof that he murdered him. I don't think it's proof of anything. How did they know it was his? It could be anyone's ticket stub. I think with all the connections, Columbo's saying that we know that Lenny was outside, say, let's say that Lenny was outside the studio and asked to be taken there and he was outside the studio at 10am 10, 10 and then there was a ticket purchase for 10, 10.03 and the ticket was in, or a ticket from that time was in your clothes. Yeah, and you knew this person, you know, from back in the yeah. day, etc. Okay, well, you can see where the story's going. Yeah. You see the date and the time, sir? The day Mr. Fisher died. And the time, 12 minutes after 3 o'clock. Just two minutes after Mr. Kardashian delivered Mr. Fisher to the tour centre. So we can say that's Mr. Fisher's ticket, sir, to the studio tour. And we found the ticket in your yearbook. Bookmark. So Len Fisher had to be in your boys club on the day he died. The day, the night you murdered him by electrocution on the brownstone street. I'd say by that iron gate, sir, near where I found the heel. Do you really think some underpaid policeman is going to arrest me with all that circumstantial claptrap? Underpaid, that's where we go right back to the the heart of Colombo with the people who need taken down a peg or two underestimating our eponymous hero. Without a doubt. But Colombo has more than this ticket to stub. Yeah, he now reveals that he used the killer's trick against him. Yes, that Rose was in fact a setup, and that his bribe is further evidence. Columbo also knows that the two women in the restaurant were actors that Alex himself had set up. He, he made that a bit too obvious because he used folk dressed up as characters that weren't in any of the movies that were being filmed, hadn't he? Yes. <laughs> Columbo then tells Alex he has witnesses from the restaurant. Witnesses to what? The admission of the call, I guess. Is that witnesses to the meeting with Rose? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because it wouldn't have been witnesses to the... Columbo's encounter. Yeah. No, no, it's the one with Rose. Although what the evidence from that is, I don't know. Anyway, with some dramatic flair, he then introduces the, the two cops and Ruth. It's like a curtain call. Yes. It's bizarre. Very bizarre. But did it really happen? No. I, don't, I think this is in Alex's mind. What do you call it? Uh, Fight Club stuff? Kind of, yeah. It's basically, he knows the game is up and mm-hmm. he is halluc- almost not. I don't even know if he's hallucinating or we're seeing what's going through his mind. Okay. But certainly, I, I don't think this is real. I don't think these people are in the room. So do you think this is like they were seeing the mental breakdown of Alex? Yeah. It's like uh, Shutter Island? Yes, a bit like that. Or even, to an extent, the Spectre Calls that we talked about mm-hmm. earlier. Yeah. Alex now looks defeated. 
as Columbo tells him that he is going to take great pleasure in charging him with murder. And then what happens? Columbo takes a bow. And what? His outfit changes into... Let's not talk about it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like a ringmaster, Yeah, perhaps? Yeah. Like he's been orchestrating this all along. Sure. It's... Yeah, it's a... It's a there are very sort of surreal touches through it. Yeah, the again, episode. I suspect this is Alex's perception of Columbo. You really are taking this quite... Okay. That's my feeling. Yeah. I mean, what else could it possibly be? Columbo goes to Shutter Island. Do you think Columbo brought the outfit with him? I don't think that happened. I don't know. It's using the, the technology. Maybe he filmed this and then it's a 3D thing. Oh, it could be a 3D outfit over the top of Columbo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just all a, bit, a little bit odd, isn't it? But uh, entertaining. Yeah, Alex kind of spirals into despair at this point and that's the end. Mm-hmm. So, thoughts? Well, like I said at the start, there were some things that jarred, but there were other things that were really quite good. What did you like? I liked the killer's performance in general. I liked his scenes with the victim. Mm-hmm. I quite liked his scenes with Columbo, yeah. apart from that last bit there. Mm. And I enjoyed the actual murder. I thought that was quite nicely done, and I quite liked the way that Columbo turned things around, although I didn't like that we didn't know about it till after. What were the jarring elements? Well, like I said, that sort of 80s teen movie moment, in fact there was a couple of those with um, Ruth, Mm -hmm. that was not good. The bit at the end there with the curtain call and the bit with the fence, Mm. and the bit on the chair when they're going around in circles okay. and stuff like that. And similar to last week with a weird sort of ending. Yeah. And there are things that they are doing to sort of soften or make it less realistic. Why? I think it must have been the 80s. It must have been the style. Mm. Maybe that's what they thought audiences wanted. Could be. Back then. Hard for us to say really. What they should have done is got the kid from Flight of the Navigator in instead of the gun from mm-hmm. Short Circuit. Who who played the voice of Max in Flight of the Navigator? I shouldn't know this, but you'll tell me. Paul Rubens, okay. a.k.a. Pee Wee Herman. It's a piece of trivia that people will adore. I'm sure they will. Good yeah. movie. Sarah Jessica Parker. Yeah, it's a great movie. Mm. In fact, it's one of my childhood favourites, along mm. with um, a terrible movie called Mac and Me with Paul Rudd. Yes, I'm aware of that. <laughs> uh, on, a similar, on a similar theme, yesterday I sat down and watched half an hour of Daryl which was on. Remember that as well? I used to really enjoy that. Yeah. That was I used to know what it stood for as well. But Oh, yeah. No, it was, uh, who cares? Nah, I don't know. But back to Columbo. Not disappointed? Enjoyable? Yeah. I, I quite liked it. It's clearly different from what we were seeing in the 70s. A very, it's almost a different show. Yeah. It's got a different vibe to it, I think. Um, yeah, there's just something. Like I said last week, I think it's just a little bit lighter, a little bit more... Less, they're trying to be more. It seems to me that they're trying to update the show to 1989. They're trying to make it fit in with it's what's going on in television in 1989. Yeah, but it's a little bit more frivolous. It's not quite as. It's, it's more. Ent- they're, they're trying to put more um, uh, emphasis on perhaps being funny and entertaining as opposed to being a detective show. Yeah. Which yeah. it's not necessarily a criticism, but you can certainly. You know, you can you, you you can work that out. You can you do you do recognise that? I think. I think that's absolutely right from what I can see so far. Mm-hmm. Well, we what do you fancy in production information or episode review? Next? Production information. Any remaining trivia? And we'll finish up with the review. Okay, okay. Um, production information. Twenty seventh of February, nineteen eighty nine, at the ninety five minute length. Director was a familiar name, James Frawley. Fourth of six. Uh, directorial roles the first being Try and Catch Me it's getting harder and harder to find show notes links for him <laughs> Richard Allen Simmons was the writer and we've discussed him before because he is now the main producer and he wrote this episode there this is go. the only one he wrote he's the fellow that had all the big ideas for season 7 yes about how he wanted Columbo to be portrayed going forward it's interesting that a lot of folk on the forums are unhappy with the changes in season 7 yeah I must admit I'm surprised by that I agree. I like season seven very much. Yeah. Anyway, Simmons, the writer, man producer, died in 2004, aged 80. As I mentioned, this was his only writing credit on Columbo. He was the creator of Mrs. Columbo. 
Uh, and he was also known for the Dick Pill Theatre and uh, Major Pain, which was a 1995 movie. It's a lot of old garbage with one of the Wayne brothers. Oh dear. Yeah, terrible. Although Last Boy Scout with one of the Wayne brothers was good. What was it? Good action movie with Bruce Willis. Yeah. Underrated. Okay. Yeah, good action. If you like action. Yeah. 90s action. Like Die Hard, I like that. It's not as good as Die Hard. Nothing's as good as Die Hard. Except for Die Hard 2. No, shut up. Die Hard 3, per- perhaps. Die Hard 3, also good. Die Hard 2 was poorish. No. Yeah. No. 1, the best. 3, second best. Then 2, 4 and 5. 4 wasn't a Die Hard movie. It was just a movie that John Bruce Willis plugged into. And I didn't see uh, the 5th one. The 5th one's just the same. Uh, yeah. Just as bad. So, uh, any other information here? We had uh, Jerome Guardino, again playing Sergeant Burke. I don't remember any other... Oh, yes, at the end, when they did the curtain call. Yeah. Ah. So, uh, Guardino's back. Back for more. Mm -hmm. Trivia, not a lot here. Uh, We've mentioned both pieces before. Alex, obviously based on Spielberg, and the episode was filmed in Universal Studios, so a cheap, a cheap-ish episode, I would have thought. Episode review. Okay. Motive. Protect his career. Yep. Silence a threat of a career ending exposure and uh, Scandal, yeah. criminal uh, potentially going to, to, to prison. Really? I think mm-hmm. it's more of the reputational. No, not with the video. I suppose they neglect, criminal neglect. Yeah, you can prove that you didn't do anything about this. Mm. Didn't report a, a crime or yeah. an accident okay. which caused death. Clues. The book with the number, the book on the shelf, the ice cream glasses, Len and Alex annoying each other, Jenny's death. The cab driver, the cable and the heel, the bookmark ticket, Rosie's bribe, and the actors in the restaurant. I think also the bit with Phil and Ruth is a hint. Okay. Certainly gave Columbo an idea what to do, but I think that helps with the solving of the mm-hmm. the fake lead. Sure. Yeah. The gotcha. Yeah. What do you think? Well, playing the video and then, yeah, I think it's, it's all right. Pretty strong. Yeah. Happy to go to, to take that to court, would you be, if you were uh, the DA? Well, I don't know. I well, don't know. It is a big circumstantial case, but we'll come out at the end of the season. We will. We will. Next week, a racier sounding title for you, Ian. Sex and the Married Detective. Ah, uh, that mm-hmm. sounds intriguing. Mm-hmm. Okay, before we wrap things up, Ian, anything you want to say or do? No, 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 quite happy with that. Just thank folk again for their contributions to the, the forums on columbopodcast.com, to the Twitter, at Columbo Podcast. Even on Facebook, we're getting some good feedback. So keep it up. We love it coming every week and hearing what you're all thinking. Also, as always, iTunes reviews, ratings help more people find the show. So if you've got a couple of minutes to do that, it would be very much appreciated. It certainly would be. I think that's it, yeah? Yeah, we'll see you all next week. Okay, bye-bye. Cheerio. You have been listening to the Columbo Podcast from Heard Yet Media.